Tell us about the uh, the journey and what you've learned uh, in that process. It's been a journey, you know, not all success, probably more failures than success. You know, when you're going in and it's just a business deal and it's all about numbers and your commission, you're not going to last long. The main marketing strategies I see here is hiring a big billboard. We have a law to not have billboards. Otherwise, oh. that would be a great idea. Maybe what are some of the challenging things you've had to face and, you know, what lessons did you glean from that that might be, uh, you know, to our advantage to hear about? If just one question could immediately transform the quality of your life or the results of your business, would you want to know what that question was? Life and business strategist Kevin Bees interviews success masters to discover their life-changing questions. Welcome to the Life-Changing Questions Podcast. Welcome back to episode 245 of the Life-Changing Questions podcast. Today, we have a wonderful lady coming all the way from Hawaii. Her name is Lailan Bento. She began her career within the governor's office in Hawaii, gaining unparalleled experience and understanding the Hawaiian laws and regulations and establishing herself as a respected businesswoman. She's widely known for her relentless drive, her integrity, and her expertise. And after years in the industry... She opened Hawaiian's Development Group, where she serves as the principal broker. Her clients' happiness and satisfaction are the foundation of her success, which shows in her exceptional record of going above and beyond for others. Now, she's incredibly proud of her Hawaiian home and heritage. Her love of the island and its people shines through in her character, making her an exemplary model of true spirits of aloha. So, uh, so welcome. So glad to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, Kevin. In the short time we've already been speaking before the podcast, I feel amazing connection with you. I can tell you're doing amazing things for the island and for the people that you work with. And of course, you've already mentioned, you know, the, the desire to uh, to give back and your scholarship fund. So, so maybe tell us a little bit about what is life like there in Hawaii, and what is that? What is the business of you know real estate? How how are things going there? Real estate is phenomenal. Um, you have you know it's always a strong market here in Hawaii. It may dip a little, but it won't ever fall off a cliff just because Hawaii has one of the, you know, strictest building regulations in the country. And so to be able to build, you know, homes and developments here, it takes many, many years. And so the inventory is always, you know, very, very low, even before COVID happened. And so that makes it strong. And then, you know, we have a lot of U.S. buyers as well as local buyers and many international buyers. In fact, we have an entire, um, there's actually an entire section from there's many Australians that buy in Hawaii too. So you have the Asian market, Canadians, and then Australians that buy here. So the market is still strong. The median rate is up. Inventory is going up a little bit, but the median we would think would go down still holding strong there. Yeah. Wow, that's uh, that's great. And of course, you say uh, low inventory. So as a business owner, you must be really good at your marketing to make sure you uh, you get the the properties that come up for sale. Yes, absolutely. And you have to be able to, you know, we sell, you can sell throughout the state, but on our particular island, we have 11 of the 13 world climates on our one island. So every district is vastly different. You have like a desert area, mountains that snow and, you know, beaches, of course, rainforest. So it's every little district, there's a place actually for everyone, you know, if they want to buy here on the big island, it just depends what climate they want to live in. And of course, uh, not in the, the too distant past, you know, we saw in the news, there was uh, certainly a, you know, massive fires there that uh, the devastated. Was that on your island or was that uh, a different part? That was on island of Maui in the town of Lahaina. And then where I um, reside in the resort area on the west side of what we call the Big Island, which is also Hawaii Island, there were small wildfires here, but nothing like Lahaina, which is on the island of Maui that happened a year ago back in August of last year. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That was a year ago already. Uh, I know uh, the time, time clearly flies. Now yeah. you tell us about your journey because you didn't start off in real estate. You've uh, navigated yourself there from a beginnings in the governor's office. So I'd imagine a very different world being in, uh, you know, politics and regulations to now coming and working in commerce and industry. So tell us about the, uh, the journey and what you've learned uh, in that process. I worked at the government for a former governor for eight years, and that has actually served me well going into business and real estate because I'm able to quickly navigate, which can be very confusing, the different government departments if you need to help a client, say, with planning or permitting or, you know, Department of Water Supply, it, they get all, you know, it can be confusing to try and understand them. 
So I, I am glad that I was able to, you know, understand all the different departments cause, and have those connections with those directors and those people that are in the different government departments, because that helps my clients, you know, we're able to, you know, help them quickly um, with any hurdles that they do have building homes or a development or affordable housing here. And then after that, I went, uh, I also come from the hospitality industry. So I did work in sales, selling Hawaii for many years. And so between the government and selling Hawaii for so many years, uh, you know, on the culture and why people should come and visit, uh, it worked well for me going transitioning into real estate. And I did well in hotel sales. And then one day I thought, why am I on salary? And I'm making these owners all this money and I'm just, you know, working seven days a week and it just didn't make sense. I think my hourly wage, I probably should have when I added it all up, worked in McDonald's, right? When you're on salary, that's kind of how they get you in corporate America. And uh, I thought one day, well, you know what? I always want to go into real estate. I have no idea what I'm getting into. And just, again, I was scared. I passed the test and I was like, I think this is a sign and just jump, you know, you just start off with whoever, you know, your family, friends, selling to them, the basketball mom, soccer moms, right? I thought that's my little sphere of influence. They say to start, you know, in sales with that. And yeah, it, it's been a journey, you know, not all success, probably more failures than success, but it's been fun and helping people, which I enjoy doing, you know, buy a home here, which can be hard in Hawaii being very expensive is just, yeah, makes my day every time I'm able to hand those keys over to a family. That's beautiful. Sometimes we learn more from our failures than our successes. So you mentioned there'd be more failures than success for you. So maybe what are some of the challenging things you've had to face and you know, what lessons did you glean from that that might be, uh, you know, to our advantage to hear about? I think, you know, just learning the business and having clients want to buy, you know, certain properties. And then when a client buys a property, I'm pulling permits, I'm pulling everything I can on the property. And sometimes you, you know, you're in the middle of escrow and then I don't know, they, the septic backs up or you, you find this failure and then you have to, you know, get the client out or, you think they, you can help them with a particular loan and then that doesn't work out, you know, and it's always the canceled escrows. But to me, I've played sports most of my life. So it's like, I go down fighting like, okay, what else? See, there's always a solution, right? You have to pivot. What if, does this work? Does this work? And so it's like, finally, no, Elon, it has to cancel. They have to find something else to buy, right? I just feel like I go in the way I do real estate is as if this is my family, right? Or like I'm the mom and these are my kids. So I need to make sure, you know, that they're going to make it to the finish line, right? Or if we need to cancel, I can get them out without being in trouble, right? Or them getting in trouble with their deposit being, you know, given to the other party. So I think um, doing business that way of your clients are become like your family or, if, or you know, helping my clients like, is that I would, I'm selling it to them like if I'm selling it to my mom, right? So I think that has helped me tremendously in my business of it's not just a transaction. I think that also has to do with our culture. Our Hawaiian culture is, you know, giving, right? And helping. And that's our core values. So it became natural to just be able to help people in real estate. It's such a beautiful uh, analogy or metaphor, you know, uh, to, to see you as the mother. It kind of feels like you're going to protect, uh, yeah. you know, and take care of your customers in that journey. And so that, that actually feels very good. And I think you made the key piece. It's not just a transaction. I think in real estate, it can be, you know, a lot of real estate brokers, not all of them, there's some really great ones out there, but uh, many of them will just see you like, hey, if I can do this deal with you, you might not need to buy another property for 20 or 30 years. So like, why build the relationship? But I'm, right. I'm getting the sense it's not the case with you. You build this relationship with people and they feel taken care of by you. Hence, uh, hence what we said in the beginning, you know, your client's happiness and satisfaction are the foundation. Right. Absolutely. You know, people before profit, right? I feel like the sales will come, the business will come if you take care of each person, right? If you put them first, right? Which I feel, you know, real estate's a tough industry, but I feel like if you're just consistent and you're there with the best intentions and you have integrity and you just keep going, you know, so that you're able to sleep at night, right? That it's all about people, right? And I think, you know, when you're going in and it's just a business deal and it's all about numbers and your commission, you're not going to last long. I love that. It's an important message, people before profit. And, you know, you wow. have the best intentions for the people around you. You take care of them and, you know, the, the profit will follow in return. And particularly, it's a, uh, it's a long-term view there. 
sometimes, you know, you might sacrifice a little bit of profit on this deal, but in the longer term, I think that will come back around because you're helping people. Now, you spoke about it's part of your culture or as part of the way that you behave and you show up. I wonder if you can tell us about some of these, these key principles that are unique to, uh, you know, to your region. That's the Aloha spirit, right? And what is the Aloha spirit is to give back, to help, to give. And I think that's what draws people to Hawaii, right? They want to live here. It's a safe place. We all know each other. Um, people are actually genuinely nice here, um, which I love about, you know, not just being Hawaiian, but, you know, when I lived elsewhere, I've lived in California and then I was dying to come back, right? It's very different there. And you can't just pick up the phone and someone knows you, right? So I think that, and then, you know, we say ha 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 means to be humble. So things like even this podcast, you know, our culture, you know, they, people have a hard time bragging about their success and stuff. And so that's part of our culture. And then also, you know, just to, to give back, but also we're all raised with, there's a term, it's called kuleana. To have kuleana means that means your responsibility. So your responsibility as a Hawaiian is to give back to your community, to give back to your ohana, which is your family, right? And so that I've really ingrained in me. And a lot of my agents are actually Hawaiian born and raised here. So we understand you're not just, you know, helping a family, but you're also explaining and embracing them and teaching them what this place is all about. Right. And so I think that, you know, it's just special about who I am. There's not very many Hawaiian realtors, you know, and I think it's special that we're able to explain, you know, the place, the history, because that's what draws people here to begin with. Right. They come on one vacation. They want to keep coming back. Yeah. I, I haven't been, but the way you describe it, I, uh, I think it needs to be my next family's trip. <laughs> it sounds, sounds beautiful. <laughs> and so this, uh, this philosophy of uh, Kuliana is, uh, you know, very important. You spoke about giving back. I know before we got on the call, we we're having some conversations, you know, about uh, about your daughter being off to university and of course, uh, you know, the scholarship fund as well. So, so tell us about what you're doing there and, and how you're uh, using this philosophy of Kuliana to, to really make a difference with that. So growing up, I was uh, raised on an, a place called um, Hawaiian Homelands. And Hawaiian Homelands, you have to, it's leasehold land and there are hundred year leases and they, you have to be at least 50% Hawaiian bloodline of blood quantum. And so being raised in that type of environment, my parents, we were always the middle class and the middle class Hawaiians, you don't really get, fi you're never going to get financial aid anywhere. All of the Hawaiian scholarships, college funds, therefore either, you know, not kids are not in the middle class or maybe orphans. So growing up, seeing my dad, a blue collar worker, you know, working all the time, I saw that my siblings and I never got, you know, you, you just miss it, right? Oh, your parents make too much, but I'm like, my dad's a blue collar worker, you know? And so seeing that and then seeing my daughter go through the same thing, I thought, you know what, I'm going to create a scholarship fund. This was my first year and it was for kids. I didn't care what their financial background was because I was the middle class kid that got nothing. And as long as they were doing well in school, in a trade school, in college, I gave my company gave eleven thousand dollars this year to Hawaiian and local kids to go to college, which was phenomenal. And it opened up kind of a gateway because all of the scholarships that you'll see are foundations. They don't target the middle class, which is, you know, that's the working class. Right. And so I did this was my first year. I had a lot of fun with it. Um, so that was part of like, okay, Lailan, your business is doing well, you're doing well. How are you going to give back? Right. So I started that, I'm starting a nonprofit to continue to do that. And then also we just recently, my company adopted our county parks for the kids. So that's to maintain all the parks, right? I picked a couple of parks I saw that were run down, um, that our county doesn't have enough money to take care of. And you know, growing up playing sports, I mean, the parks are part of your life as a kid, right? Especially in Hawaii. I mean, there's not too much to do on the, we call it outer islands, right? For the kids. So, yeah, those are just a couple of things I thought, you know, as a start, right, to start doing. It's a, it's, it's a very great start. And even if you didn't do anything more than that, it's already a, a major impact. I mean, how many uh, you know, children are going to be positively impacted by, by what you're doing there? And of course, I think back to being a kid, we spend a lot of our time in parks and in playgrounds. And I'm sure where we grew up, some of those uh, would have uh, really benefited from someone like you coming and making a difference. So uh, it's, it's, it's phenomenal to hear that. Now, of course, right. you to continue with this uh, you new know, Kuliana and giving back. It, it really comes down to, you know, your ability to keep 
driving things forwards in the business. Now, I appreciate particularly real estate is very competitive place. And it sounds like particularly in, you know, in your location. So what are some of the strategies that you use to stay ahead in the, in the marketplace? I do social media, uh, you know, the traditional marketing, social media is a big thing. I'm trying to get back into it. Um, I network, I'm involved in several organizations. So that is always great, right? In the business networking, um, that arena, and then just marketing heavily from Google ads, just different things, but I'm always pivoting, right? So every month I kind of look at what's making sense, what's not making sense, you know, for example, Zillow a couple of years ago was a phenomenal, right? To use as marketing today, not so much. Redfin the same, right? Was amazing, not so much now. So I just looking at my business and trying to see and trying to change, I feel like not only ego kills business, but a closed mind closes business. I feel, you know, it's going to keep you stagnant. You know, when I got into real estate, it's such a big age gap. And I would ask, you know, a lot of the old timers and experienced realtors, what do they do? And then I said, I'm going to do Yelp. They thought I was crazy. Or I'm going to do Zillow. They thought I was crazy. But I, I was at, you know, just starting out and there are all of these new things, right? New, new uh, marketing channels. And they were at, you know, I, I had to step back and look and I thought, well, they're at, in their career referral based, right? They've been in it for decades. And so I always explain that to people, you know, what, like especially new agents, right? The more channels I feel in marketing you can do, email newsletters, the better instead of, hey, I'm just going to be a YouTube star, right? I feel like more channels, most people, business comes from all different channels, right? It could be a chamber of commerce luncheon, or it could be, you know, I don't know, Redfin or something. And that I find heavily um, client testimonies, you know, and reviews, that's another thing. But I think, you know, just trying out new things, being open, trying out new things. I network and meet with other business owners too, because I feel like bouncing ideas. And what I notice is we're all in this together, going through the same thing, right? Same struggles. And so I think bouncing ideas with other business owners helps me too, just to see, you know, what's working, what's not working. One of the uh, the main marketing strategies I see here for the real estate uh, agents in our area is hiring a big billboard and, uh, you know, putting the face on the billboard. So is it uh, a similar practice there? We have a law to not have billboards. Otherwise, that would be a great idea. Yeah, there's a signage ordinance for every county. It's interesting. I've had people ask that question, which I thought that would be nice to have, right? Billboards are amazing. I pay attention to them when I go to the cities. Yeah. Okay, well, and it's interesting for me because I think the first time I came to this area, we walked into a, a viewing and we kind of felt a little bit like the guy was a celebrity because we've seen his face on many billboards. <laughs> and so you, you kind of feel like this, uh, like, oh, you know, he's someone famous. No, he's not. He's yeah. just paid for some, some very specific billboards. But uh, okay, you can't do that there. So hence, you're, uh, <laughs> you're being a little bit more flexible, trying out yeah. different channels and you know, going what's what's working. And like you say, if the older uh, generation have been relying so much on referrals and word of mouth, you're, yeah. you're going a step further by embracing the newer technology, which is, uh, which is great. Now, I appreciate you, uh, you know, you have a daughter who is uh, just right now leaving to head off to university. But I guess over all those years, you've been building your business and of course, trying to balance, you know, family, personal life. So do you have any, yeah. any tips on, uh, on how, 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 how do you do that successfully? I am still struggling with that. And I have, I have to be honest, uh, when my daughter was younger, she was about, I don't know, 10. And she did not like real estate. She would have to go to open houses with me. She would have to sit in the car during showings. And I went to this business, this, she was a business, almost like a life business coach, uh, luncheon, my girlfriend had invited me. Right. And they came to me and I said, you know, my daughter, they said, does your daughter want to do real estate? And I said, no, she hates it. And then she said, well, give me a day in your, your life. Right. And then I was explaining to her and then she said, don't answer your phone until eight o'clock. Cause that's when I would drop my daughter off because what I was doing I'm, I get up, I'm starting with the, the text messages, the phone calls, I'm throwing her breakfast at her, right? And she's like eating by herself. I'm on the phone, on the computer, and it's it's chaos. Instead of like, you know, before she gets up, doing all of that, spending the time actually sitting down with her, having breakfast, because that's how I was raised. My mom was at home, right? And then 
taking her to school because that's how she's viewing real estate, right? Like, oh my gosh, my mom's like throwing off the cereal to me or something, right? And so I had to really step back with that. And it made me look at it, you know, as a mom in a different perspective, like, okay, you have to be aware of like, you know, pay attention here, right? Instead of just like, just get up in the morning, you're jamming already working. I, I've gotten a lot better. I've uh, turned my phone on silent. So I'm not waking up at three o'clock on the phone. You know, it just, your quality of life too, right? Of staying healthy, going for a run, just kind of, you know, stepping out of that grind and then coming back into it, right? And I think for those of us with younger children, it's a, it's a very good message and reminder. Uh, you know, it can be so easy to get sucked into work in the morning or into the evening, but uh, that quality time, um, I, I guess, as you're, uh, you're sharing with me before the call, you know, the, the time when they, they leave and head off to college or university or leave home comes by quicker than, than we think. So I think that's a really uh, valuable tip. And, and thank you so much for that. Um, how do you decide, you know, which neighborhoods or properties to invest in? Um, well, for Hawaii, a lot of people come here, if, if they're an investor or owning it as, as a second home, they're looking for a vacation rental, right? A short-term vacation rental, which I had to learn, um, you know, every island in our state is different. Our island was the most lenient when they did pass a vacation rental law a couple of years ago. But I didn't realize that not most, but a lot of the parts where these investors were coming from, you can just turn any home into a vacation rental. So I think you know, explaining to them, okay, only these areas, right, which are the more desired areas, you're able to short-term vacation rent, which are my surrounding neighbors. So, you know, when people want to buy, it's nice, the nicest beaches, restaurants, you have all the amenities, but it comes at a higher price, higher homeowners association fees. And so it's kind of explaining to them um, because a lot of people will try to, you know, they want to invest just anywhere here, but they want to turn it into a vacation rental. So kind of explaining, okay, you know, kind of showing them a map. Okay. Just stay in these areas. Um, in fact, I have a, uh, two families coming next week that that's what they're, I'm going to take them around and, you know, I'm going to take them to the different areas to kind of explain so they can visually see. And then usually they're able to decide after that where they want to live. Beautiful. I think that's, uh, that's just so great. Now, uh, given that things are changing all the time and there are different trends, you know, coming along, what are maybe some of the latest trends, uh, you know, in the real estate market that you're excited by? A uh, real estate trends, I would say it's just, you know, it's staying busy. I thought it would, you know, slow down a little bit, you know, you know, I hate to say this the election. Sometimes it, you know, usually when the election comes around, it kind of gets quiet. And then as soon as the next day after the election, the phones start ringing again, because I think people kind of know what direction or they feel what direction we're all headed. So that and I think um, for me, I've been working with my mom on a development for the last 10 years. So I'm excited about this development. It will be the largest in the state. And majority of it is going to be affordable housing, which we desperately need. We're in a housing crisis, especially for, we say affordable, but it's more workforce housing. So for the middle class, teachers, police officers, and our island where I live, you have 12,000 people commuting to this, just this area every day that drive, you know, they leave home at four in the morning and they get home at 8 p.m. So Again, talking about the quality of life, right? They're not able to watch their kids play sports or coach soccer. And so to be able to have that development right in the heart of where a lot of the jobs are on the island is going to be crucial to, you know, family life, right? Affordability and then family life also. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. And, and 10 years in the making. So uh, how far yes. are you off? Uh, we're looking in a couple of months to start construction. So that will be exciting. I am very excited to see that go finally go because our island desperately needs it. We have so many middle-class families leaving out of Hawaii because they can't afford it, you know, and working two or three jobs. So if they're in the area that they're working, it's, it's going to be phenomenal, I think. And so if construction starts, like it sounds imminently, uh, how, how soon before the, you know, the development is complete? Are, are you talking, is this it's like a, one or two years or is this like half a decade or something? They're looking to possibly go up to 6,000 homes. So that will take about 15 mm -hmm. years in Hawaii to build. But as long as, you know, you're having different, you know, families constantly moving in. So I'm thinking maybe next year, the end of next year. And we have a database. I've had it for years. Of, I keep adding on families, you know. 
there's also on this side of the island, it's not just a lot of the jobs, but also many of the hotels, right? So that is a huge industry of employment. And they all live on the other side of the island. So I always explain to people, you can fit all the islands in Hawaii into our one island. That's how big it is. And so when people think, oh, just drive down the street home, it's like, no, it's like a two lane road crossing the island. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Six, 6,000 homes. That's like significant. What an impact that's going to have on the region. And no wonder it's uh, taken, taken a decade of planning to create this. Right. And between the, you know, you have so many red, t- so much red tape, right. Between the County and state, which I understand because many decades ago, Hawaii had so much building, right. So many developments going up by the ocean and it wasn't planned out correctly. And so now I think they're a little bit too strict, but they're trying to, you know, within reason, develop the islands, which I, I can see that point too, right? If not, we don't want to, if you've ever been to the island of Oahu where Waikiki is, it's just overcrowded and buildings on top of buildings. So I know they're trying to, you know, be a little bit more smart about it, right? And have it planned out instead of just, you know, approving buildings everywhere, which won't make sense. Yeah. Tell me a bit about your uh, inspiration around this then, because it's one thing to to sell real estate. It's another thing to go into a development project, it's especially one of this uh, size. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a small undertaking. No. Um, my mom is a listing agent, so she's pretty much spearheaded that. I started our company, Hawaii Development Group, with my mom, and she mostly handles that development side because that is there's so many moving parts, moving plates to just get a development going. You know, there's so many people involved, engineering, architects, you know, community involvement, uh, the county, housing. It's just a big undertaking. But I've learned quite a bit of how to turn dirt into an actual subdivision you know, or subdivisions, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. The amount of families that are going to be helped by it is uh, significant. So that's, that's really wonderful. Uh, let's go to the core of the podcast. We say that the quality of the questions we ask ourselves impacts the quality of the life that we lead. With that being true, what's one question you've asked that's had the biggest positive impact on your life or, uh, or the life of the people that you serve? I think um, I always ask myself, you know, when I look at my goals, but I always ask myself, what's my why? I had a boss that asked, you know, taught me that many years ago, you know, what is your why? You know, and my why is, okay, what are you doing every day? And why are you doing that? Right. And I, I feel like that just keeps me grounded of like, okay, I'm, am I reaching my goals? Why am I doing this? Okay, to better the life of my family and to better the life of my community, right? Um, I think that keeps me going. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes it, this summer it took me into perspective with my 21-year-old healthy child, an athlete her whole life, one of the fastest kids in the state, um, you know, got diagnosed out of nowhere with multiple sclerosis this summer. So that question of why that I ask myself every day was like, okay, recentered me of, okay, you know, now it's shifting of what is your why, right? Now you have this to deal with and, you know, we're going to get through it and so far so good. But, you know, asking yourself that question of why, right? Why are you doing this? What are you doing? I think really centers me every day. That's a question I always ask myself to make sure I'm keeping myself on track. Yeah, very clear. And I think it's important to stay on track and and particularly as you face challenges in business, things change, you know, you mentioned pandemics happening, property prices going up and down, interest rates going up and down, uh, elections. So, but you keep coming back to your why. And of course, for you, that's really much uh, rooted in the culture that you have there, which is uh, around Kuliano, which is, you know, how, how can I actually give back and, and make a difference to my family and to my community, which is, uh, is wonderful. Uh, You shared so much value and so much um, insight today. I'm I'm so grateful for the time that we've had together. For anyone listening, if you uh, feel like you want to move to Hawaii or you want to purchase a property there or uh, or even, you know, uh, reach out and and get connected, then wherever you are, just click on the show notes there. There's there's links back to the website. If if you can't click, then you can just check out uh, lilonbento.com or uh, or type, type that name into any of the social media channels and you get there. Uh, Lailon, uh, I, I wonder, do you have any final messages, anything you'd like to share with uh, with the community today? No, I just want to say thank you, Kevin, for having me on. I really enjoyed myself. And if you're out there and you have any questions about anything in Hawaii, 
you know, moving here, schools, I mean, just just anything. What's the climate like? People have a lot of questions. You know, how do I invest? Just please reach out and, you know, ask me anything, contact me. Um, and all the contact information is going to be below. So thank you. That's beautiful. I have one final question for you on that then. Since uh, you, you know, with the work you do with your development group, how do you see the, uh, the real estate landscape changing over the next decade or two? I think if you look historically with Hawaii, I think it, it is going to be, you know, still strong. I think since Lahaina, that kind of caught everyone's attention of, you know, all those families don't have homes. So I know the state's trying to pivot and they're starting to look at other things. They're starting to change how, you know, it had taken so long for so many affordable housing developments, including the one I'm on, to really move forward. So I feel like things like Lahaina happening on a positive note is really catching caught the attention of a lot of our, you know, politicians, our administration to really change how quickly and, you know, we are, you know, building homes here because people without a home, people have, you know, they have nothing, right? And so I look at that, you know, as a positive for the state. And I think you're going to start to see a lot more affordable housing and housing in general in our state. So I'm excited to see that. I love that. So crystal clear. So uh, if you're looking to uh, to do this, looking to move to Hawaii, uh, then of course you want to work with someone who is going to treat you uh, and behave like your mom and make sure you're very well taken care of. And so I think we Good. found that uh, found that today. And yeah. wherever you are, just make sure you're asking yourself, you know, what is my why? If, particularly if you're facing some challenges, some struggles, getting reconnected with your why and your purpose can be the very thing that gives you the emotional juice to uh, to keep going and to keep moving on. So, uh, so thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thanks so much for listening to the Life Changing Questions podcast with your host, Kevin Bees. We'll catch you next time.